Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our next talk. And I'm very glad to present uh, Associate Professor, Medical Doctor and Philosophy Doctor, Sarah Wikström to our conference. And I would like to start with saying a few sentences about Sarah's career path uh, that had started at the University of Helsinki in Finland, where Sarah obtained first her medical doctor degree in 2001. And then three years later, in 2004, she received a PhD. Afterwards, Sarah had moved to Germany, where she worked as a postdoc at uh, Reinhard Festler's lab at the MPI for biochemistry in Munich until 2010. And in 2010, Sarah has founded her own group at the MPI for Biology of Aging in Cologne, focusing on skin uh, homeostasis and aging. And in 2018, Sarah's career brought her back to Finland uh, to the newly founded Helsinki Institute for Life Sciences at the University of Helsinki, where Sarah got invited to the position of associate professor. Sarah and her group continued to work on epidermal stem cells and how mechanical forces and cellular interactions integrate single cell behaviors to pattern multicellular tissues. Um, of course, we're all very curious to hear about this topic from Sarah herself. So Sarah, the stage is all yours. Please start. Thank you very much, Julia. Can everybody hear me? So, um, yeah, first of all, thank you for the kind introduction and, and the invitation. It's always a biggest honor to be invited by the students. So my lab is interested in um, how tissues are formed and maintained. And, and one of the tissues that we are particularly interested in is, is the skin epidermis. And it's a very important tissue that is, forms a barrier between us and the outside world and prevents entry of pathogens and, and on the other hand, prevents evaporation of, of water from, from our bodies. And, and the epidermis develops from this single layer of progenitors and then a symmetric baking happens where a subset of, of these stem cells decide to differentiate and at the same time they move upwards in the layers to form these differentiated layers where every single layer they represents a further differentiated state and in the end these cells will die and slough off. So during development, but also constantly during adulthood, the epidermis is self-renewed where we actually slough off 500 million cells every day. So there's a tremendous need for these stem cells to generate new cells that will then differentiate and move upwards. And, and this uh, raises the question, how do you coordinate the cell fate decisions and, and the position of, of these cells within the structure? And on the other hand, how do you do it in a situation that is highly dynamic. So skin is actually one of the few tissues that continues to change its size during uh, adulthood. So, so basically um, we need to also, the cells need to be dynamic and change their behavior all the time. And also we know that there's injuries that need to be rapidly repaired and so on. Oh, no, I somehow can't, yes. So basically the question is how do the stem cells, which are the only dividing tissues in the cells, coordinate their self-renewal versus differentiation behavior and couple it to the changing needs of the tissue, which might involve the need to expand or, or shrink the tissue. And we know a bit about this regulation from studies from a lot of labs in the field where they people have studied the regulation on the population level. And we know that on the population level, the regulation is actually strikingly simple. So when there's a need to grow the tissue, for example, postnatally, when the organism is in this growth phase, the stem cells or, or progenitors, they actually just balance their self-renewal versus differentiating divisions so that the majority of the divisions will be self-renewing and, and there is less differentiation. Whereas then when the tissue reaches this final size, this balance is simply tipped towards these differentiating divisions. So this explains how the tissue can on the population level be flexible to balance itself towards growth or just size maintenance. And, and what has been interesting in these studies where we have also participated in collaboration with Cedric Lampin was the question, how do the cells sense to what, which day they grow? And it turns out that the tissue is actually not growing kind of in the direction of, of the extending body axis or the cells are not sensing the overall growth of the body axis, but rather orient the growth uh, in the direction of local 
topological cues. So here you can see in red, there's a clone of stem cells that we have traced by lineage tracing, so genetically labeling a stem cell, which will then self-renew and expand and form this clone. And it turns out that this clone will grow in the direction of these collagen fibers that exist here underneath the stem cell layer. And these collagen fibers generate a local tension or, or, or a, a stretch force. And then these cells are sensing that and they are oriented their growth in the direction of, of these local cues. So this basically already impl implicated that somehow mechanical forces can play a role in regulating the stem cell behavior. So we have been then asking the question is how does this regulation that we understand now on the population level, how does it occur on the level of single cells where a single stem cell has to decide whether it's going to now self-renew or differentiate? So, so basically the problem is how do the cells couple three distinct cellular processes? The decision to self-renew, to differentiate, and also at the same time move out from the basal layer niche upwards to the differentiated layers. And, and we thought that mechanical forces could be a very efficient way to kind of relay information about the tissues to the single cells. And on the other hand, the single cells to be able to coordinate their behavior with the neighbors. Because if every, every stem cell will self-renew at the same time, the tissue would grow exponentially, whereas everybody deciding to differentiate at the same time would lead to tissue shrinkage. So we hypothesized very simply that, for example, if this stem cell here would be now dividing, it might generate compressive forces to its neighbor. And maybe this compression could be a signal to the neighbor cell, for example, to differentiate. Or vice versa, if a cell would now be differentiating, and migrating upwards from the basal layer to the upper layers. This might liberate space, and this liberation of space could be a signal for the stem cell to divide. Or even going further, as also illustrated by the study with, with the collagen, that the cells could sense mechanical stresses from the extracellular matrix underneath, and this could be translated to signals of growth. And then just as a, as, a, as a sort of mention, because not all of you might be thinking about mechanical forces every day, when I'm talking about stress, I'm talking a very, about a very specific uh, phenomenon, which is basically a force that the neighboring particle exerts on, on each other, and, and strain is the resulting deformation. So we, we basically decided to, to look at this coupling of differentiation and, and self-renewal in a very simple system. And that's one of the beauties of working with the skin epidermis. We can, we can isolate these cells both from mice or humans, and we can culture them in simple 2D cultures. And then we can maintain the cells in, in the stem or progenitor state, and we can trigger their differentiation simply by applying calcium. And what will happen is that the su subset of the cells will differentiate, and they will move also upwards to form a second differentiated layer. And Kate Miroshnikova, a, a bioengineer and a postdoc in the lab, decided simply to image the cells while they are undergoing this differentiation. And she noticed something really interesting. So when the cells were in the indif undifferentiated cells set state, they underwent these very large scale coherent flows, very similar to how a fluid will respond, where you have a force and all the molecules will flow into the same direction. However, then around 24 hours after applying, uh, applying calcium, the, the mechanical properties of the cell layer changed dramatically. And suddenly, basically, the whole motility came to a halt, and the cells also stopped coordinating their motion with the neighbors. And this is something that can, can be described as a solid or a glassy or a jammed state. So the cell layer became jammed. But this is different from, let's say, you might have heard from a contact inhibition of cell growth where a confluent cell layer stopped growing because it, it, it is too full. Because in fact, the cells continue to be dividing. So here you will see in soon she a few cell divisions marked by asterisks. And the cells actually kept on dividing even beyond this 24 hour jam time point. But what happened at the same time was that now the cells started also delaminating. And what we noticed was that these delaminated cells were often in a close proximity of dividing cells. So there was this mechanical change of the entire monolayer and the coupling of cell divisions to delaminations. 
So this was, of course, in vitro. So we thought that it would be good to investigate what is happening in an intact tissue. So we took in 15.5 mouse embryos where the, the tissue is in a very actively stratifying state. So a few suprabasal differentiating layers have already formed, but this is the, the, the tissue is actively dividing and, 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 and stratifying. And we used live act, which is an actin reporter to mark cell cortexes. And what we noticed by analyzing just again, the, the motion of, of the tissue was that at this point, the tissue was already in this jam state. And what we noticed similarly, like in vitro, was that cell divisions were kind of temporally enriched at sites where we also had la delamination. So somehow there was a coupling of cell division and delamination events like in the model monolayers. And finally, the third thing that what we noticed was that, that these sites where we had this coupling of divisions and delaminations, we also saw that the cells were elongated and they were also elongated in a way that they all were elongated into the same direction. So this implies that there is so-called tension and isotropy. So the tissue is kind of being locally stretched at this point. So these, of course, were all color correlations. So the important question to ask was, does these changes in cell morphology and these local tissue stresses, do they actually somehow play a role in the differentiation of the stem cells? So Kate then went back into the in vitro system and what she decided to test was, was would this kind of experimental crowding actually trigger stem cell differentiation? And so the way, way she did it was to plate these stem cells on a stretchable silicone elastomer and, and stretch this elastomer to 120% of this original size and let the cells grow and, and fill the, the, the silicone elastomer. And then she abruptly released the tension and this caused crowding of the monolayer. And what indeed happened that this crowding now in the absence of calcium or any other differentiation signal was sufficient to actually induce the transcription of these differentiation genes. And, and this was specific to the crowding because if she did the same experiment with subconfluent monolayers to test whether this kind of buckling or, or distortion of the substrate could play a role, this did not happen. So, and in fact, the transcription of the differentiation uh, uh, genes scaled with, with the confluence state of the monolayer, really suggesting that crowding is sufficient to actually trigger stem cell differentiation. And further to kind of understand more specifically what the cells are in fact feeling when they are crowded and based on the in vivo measurements where we saw this kind of elongation and local anisotropy, what she did was to induce crowding in a little bit different way. So she induced, uh, she engineered this kind of adhesive micro patterns where we can use uh, surface chemistry to force the cells into specific geometries and specific surface areas. And she engineered two type of of geometries, circles and squares, and, and, and the surface area of these patterns is equal and they accommodate roughly the same amount of cells. The only difference are these corners here in the squared uh, micro patterns, which force the cells, as you can see here from the quantification of cell shape, force the cells to elongate. And indeed, just changing and forcing the cells to elongate was sufficient again to enhance the differentiation of the, the stem cells. And in fact, in other experiments, we were able to observe that the most powerful signal for differentiation is the simultaneous restriction of the cell adhesion area and forcing the cells into an elongated shape. So basically with this and a lot of additional work that I don't have to, uh, time to show you, we hypothesized that the cells are basically sensing, constantly sensing their geometry. And if you have a lot of proliferation and there's no need for lateral expansion, this would actually compress and force the cells into elongated shapes. And this elongation is a signal for the cells to differentiate and, and move upwards. And thereby kind of the system can self-adjust to changing needs of the tissue. But of course, then the key question is, how do the cells translate these changes in geometry into changes of cell fate? Because in the end, of course, the stem cells need to alter their transcriptome and proteome to change their state. And, and, and Hui Le, who, who is a former PhD student already now graduated, decided to ask a very simple question. What kind of genetic programs are activated or inactivated when the cells experience mechanical stress? And, and what he decided to do is instead of compressing the cells, he decided to stretch the cells because we thought that the stretching of the substrate would kind of mimic 
the lateral expansion of the tissue. And he did a simple RNA-seq experiment uh, with the hope that he would identify such mechanism sensitive programs. Now, when we got the data, we were extremely surprised because what we found instead of a subset of genes being upregulated and a subset being downregulated, we found a large number of genes that were downregulated, kind of moderately, twofold or so. So there seemed to be some sort of global transcriptional repression, and this was actually confirmed by the fact that we had spiked in this reference RNA, so we could quantify the total amount of mRNA, and we saw that in the stretch cells we had approximately 10% less mRNA altogether than in the control cells. And when we did this uh, gene set enrichment analysis to understand what kind of genes are being downregulated, all of the hits in, in this analysis somehow pointed to the specific epigenetic gene regulatory pathway called polycomb repressive complex 2. So this is a histone methyl transferase complex that catalyzes the trimethylation of histone 3 on lysine 27. And this occurs particularly at gene promoters and particularly on, on gene promoters of lineage specification genes. So in stem cells, this would be the differentiation genes. And in differentiated cells, this would be the stem cell genes. So this is basically a silencing epigenetic pathway. So this was very interesting for us. And in particular, because we knew that there is kind of a direct mechanically path, mechanical path from cell cell adhesions and cell substrate adhesions that are sensing these deformations into the nucleus and chromatin through the actin cytoskeleton. So the actin cytoskeleton links through these linker proteins to the nuclear lamina. And since head chromatin is linked to the nuclear lamina, there's a possibility that basically the, the chromatin is in the direct path of mechanical force that is transmitted here from the outside the cell. So we decided to investigate this a little bit further. And, and the first thing obviously was to confirm that we see increased levels of HVK27 trimethyl and decreased level of transcription, which can be assessed by the specific phosphorylation site serine 2 on RNA polymerase 2. So this is phosphorylated when the RNA polymerase 2 is in, it, in its elongating form. And indeed, what, what we noticed was that when he stretched the cells, there was a quite dramatic increase in this HVK27 histone mark. And this went hand in hand on the single cell level with decreased levels of elongating RNA polymerase 2. So there seem to be a transcriptional repression and a con concomitant increase in the silencing histone mark. Meanwhile, we have done chip sequencing to understand where does this increase in this histone modification occur. And, and to our surprise, we could first of all consolidate that indeed there's an increase in the abundance of this mark genome-wide in these stretch cells. But what was interesting is that this mark is not found ectopically where it normally would not be present, but rather the existing silencing becomes stronger. So here I'm showing, for example, the loricring gene, which is one of these differentiation genes in the epidermal stem cells. And you can see that in these stretch replicates, just the, the height and the breadth of the peak becomes more substantial. And if you also look at the GO terms, they are kind of this organ morphogenesis and developmental genes where you would expect this mark to be. So it seemed that we just were kind of increasing the pre-existing silencing of, of these polycomb repressive target genes. And this is kind of illustrated here if you look at this chip QPCRs that we did. So here he looked both at the elongating form of this RNA polymerase 2 to look at transcription. And he classified genes into three groups. So this uh, first group is this lineage specific PRC2 targets, which are the differentiation genes. And indeed, these genes have less RNA polymerase 2, but so do these constitutive genes such as actin or GAPDH. They also have a little bit less uh, RNA pol 2. And these genes, the Hox genes, Sox genes, they are non-lineage genes, so they are not transcribed in these cells. And indeed, they have very low levels of RNA pol 2. Now, if you look at H3K27, similarly, you see kind of an increase, but this increase is, is most substantial in these lineage-specific PRC2 targets, whereas these constitutive genes gain a little bit, but not substantial amounts of H3K27. And we know also from a lot of time resolved analysis that we did was that this transcriptional repression occurs first, followed by the silencing. And if we block RNA polymerase 2, we actually can trigger a very similar picture. So basically, our hypothesis is that this mechanical stress causes a global transcriptional repression. But because of this competition that the PRC2 complex has with the RNA polymerase 2, these 
genes that are expressed on very high levels, this 10% decrease in, in, in transcription is not sufficient to have Polycom win the competition over the promoters and these genes remain accessible and transcribed, whereas these lineage-specific PRC2 targets, which are expressed at very low levels in the stem cells because these are differentiated genes, this 10% is sufficient to kind of kick off the rna pol 2 complex, allow the Polycom complex to win the battle over these promoters and, and kind of more permanently silence the promoters. And basically the outcome of this silencing is that these cells have a hard time different to differentiate, even if we try to push them to differentiate with inducing calcium. And, and I will not go into detail, but we think that the mechanism by which this transcription repression occurs is the depletion of nuclear actin because the cells will remodel their actin cytoskeleton in the nucleus and nuclear actin is, is a transcriptional cofactor. So basically the hypothesis that we have right now is that the cells sense geometry by basically adjusting their transcriptional rates and, and basically the mechanical state that the cells is in de de determines its differentiation probability. So the mechanical signal is kind of an un unspecific threshold in effect. So if a cell is stretched, it has high levels of K27, low levels of transcription, and it is less likely to differentiate that the cell that is being under confinement that has low level of K27, and thereby this cell kind of needs less of the differentiation signal. And th that's why it becomes like a probability game where the, the, the kind of the ten tension of the tissue and thereby the cell geometry regulates who which cell will differentiate and which not, or whether there's overall less differentiation if there's a need for lateral expansion because the tissue is under stretch. Now in the final part of, of my talk, I will uh, focus on a very surprising finding that kind of came as a, as a side product of our stretch studies where we observed this transcriptional repression and the, this profound effect on differentiation. So Mikel Nava, who is another bioengineer and postdoc in the lab uh, team with Kate, to try to kind of more carefully look at what's happening to the cells when they are being mechanically stretched. And, and to do this, we, we use this very calibrated system where we can expose the cells to mechanical stress and thereby cause a strain that affects every cell on this stretched elastomer in a similar way. So we can do quantitative single cell imaging. And what they did was to do a very careful regime, both in the terms of time, but also in the terms of amplitude of, of the stretch to try to understand how the cells respond to different degrees of mechanical stretch. And here you can see just an overall look at what happens to the monolayer. And what was interesting to see was that when, when the cells are exposed to 5%, so not so much stretch, they basically the monolayer architecture doesn't really change much. Whereas if they are exposed to 40%, what will happen that over time, so around half an hour, the cells start aligning perpendicular. So they basically orient their long axis perpendicular to the direction of change. So they kind of undergo this very striking supracellular orientation. And this occurs both for the long axis of the cell as well as the long axis of the nucleus. And this doesn't ha happen in 5% even if we do the stretching for 24 hours. So there seems to be this magnitude threshold by which the supracellular alignment occurs. However, if we zoom more closely looking at the actin cytoskeleton, we notice another change. And this is the appearance of this perinuclear actin ring. And interestingly, this perinuclear actin ring was present already at this 5% threshold, but also at the 40%. And what was interesting to note that at 360 minutes, where we, when this alignment was complete in the 40%, this perinuclear actin ring has disappeared, whereas the 5%, it was still present. So there was this interesting dynamics of, of two different actin responses with the different thresholds, and one seems to kind of be traded off for another if the stretch was uh, going on for a longer time. So to understand that a bit more deeper, uh, Michele and Kate did a phosphoproteomics analysis and, and they looked at 30 minutes of stretch and, and, and 360 to kind of look at these two different uh, mechano responses. And what was interesting was that we found kind of two different patterns of, of phosphorylation regulation. And one was this kind of pattern where some phosphocytes became suppressed and they, they stayed low when the stretch was continuing. And then, then there was this one large cluster where first there was a suppression of, of the abundance of these phosphocytes, but then the phosphorylation 
fully recover despite the continuation this, of this large magnitude 40% stretch. And the geoterms of, of this particular cluster, many of them somehow were connected to another histone methylation event, which is H3K9 trimethylation. And now like the polycomb repressive complex, this is also a repressive histone mark, so it compacts chromatin and prevents transcription. But what is different from the K9 trimethylation to compare to the K27 is that the K9 trimethyl mark heterochromatin is frequently anchored to the nuclear lamina, and this anchoring is actually important for, for its silence. So this was very interesting. And indeed, Michele and Kate were able to, to confirm that we get reduced levels of the K9 histone mark. And interestingly, this occurs both in the 5% and the 40% stretch. But in the 40%, again, like the perinuclear actin ring, this, this is a reversible change. So despite continuation of this high magnitude stretch, this histone mark is, is returned to steady state at 360, which is this time point of the alignment, whereas the 5% it didn't happen. So the question is, what, what is this change good for? So again, to understand it genome-wide, we did a CHIP-seq experiment and could, could observe that indeed confirming the immunofluorescence, we have substantial loss of this K9 peaks in the stretch conditions, whereas only very few peaks were gained. However, the big surprise came when we looked at where in the genome these, these peaks are, because it, it turned out that the majority of the downregulated peaks were enriched at non-coding elements. Whereas when we looked at the few peaks that were gained, they actually were at, at coding elements. And, and, and the second interesting thing was that when we looked at where these differential peaks are distributed along the chromosomes, there was a substantial enrichment of the downregulated peaks as chromosome ends where you have the telomeres and the subtelomere in the upregulated peaks. So this kind of already suggested to us that, that these changes in K9 and particularly the decrease in K9 happens at non-coding sites at the ends of chromosomes, suggesting that maybe it doesn't have any transcriptional consequences. And this hypothesis was validated when we did an RNA sequencing experiment where we again took the 40 percent, uh, 30 minute and 360 minute time points, and we could see that the GO terms in which at 30 minutes were cell junctions kind of fitting with the rearrangement. And at the long term, it was satisfying to see that we kind of confirmed our earlier study where long-term stretch suppresses epidermal differentiation and increases this K27 pathway. However, when we cross-correlated the altered K9 peaks and these transcriptional changes, there was simply no correlation. So really confirming that these changes in K9 trimethylate seem not to have any transcriptional consequences. So then, of course, the question is, what, what, what are these changes good for? Why, why would you have this kind of large-scale heterochromatin rearrangement that don't have any transcriptional consequences? So we started thinking that maybe it has something to do with the anchoring of the heterochromatin to the nuclear lamina. So we decided to look at this in a bit more detail. And here you can see uh, transmission electron micrographs of both the control and, and the stretch cells. And you can see here, this is the nuclear lamina. And here you can see this tightly packed heterochromatin that is anchored to the lamina. And now if you look at the stretch cells, there's a couple of interesting features. First, the, there seems to be less heterochromatin close to the lamina, but also we saw this kind of wrinkle. So the nuclear lamina became wrinkled. And what was interesting was that we didn't see, we went back to the proteomics and, and we really didn't see any changes in the levels of the nuclear lamina components. We also very carefully measured the nuclear volume and the nuclear volume also seemed to be preserved. So if you take these two things together, so you see this wrinkling of the lamina without the volume change, this suggested to us that there could be changes in the mechanical properties of the nucleus and also in the nuclear membrane tension, which kind of go hand in hand. And indeed, we, we measured both. So we used a technique called atomic force microscopy, where we can indent structures and measure their elastic moduli. And what we noticed was indeed, after 40, 30 minutes of 40% stretch, the nucleus becomes softer. And again, it was reverted. So at 360 minutes, it had returned to the steady state. And also the nuclear membrane tension as predicted by the wrinkles was reduced. So somehow you had a softer, softer nucleus. And then the question was obviously, does this have something to do with the altered heterochromatin? So to, to answer this, we first 
measured kind of indirectly the mechanical properties of, of the chromatin. So we tagged telomeres with a CRISPR rainbow probe so we could measure their mobility. So we mapped the mean square displacement of, of these telomeric regions. And indeed, if we do this in the 40% 30-minute cells, we see that there's this increased mobility in response to the deformation. And to test whether the K9 decrease is responsible for this increased mobility and, and potentially also the nuclear softening, what, what Michele and Kate did was to overexpress this methyl transfer as SUV39H1, which is responsible for the trimethylation of this histone. And when they did this, they could co prevent, completely prevent the nuclear softening of, of the, in the stretch cells. And, and at the same time, they also decreased the chromatin mobility. So basically, we think that there's a change in the chromatin mobility and also its proximity to the nuclear lamina, and this makes the nucleus softer. But of course, the key question is, what is this good for? It's not, not meaningful for transcription. And, and we started thinking that maybe the cells actually need to change their mechanical properties of the nuclei to dissipate mechanical energy, because of course, the DNA is very sensitive to torsional stresses. And, and, and maybe if you have nuclear deformation, maybe the cells could experience DNA damage. And, and to our surprise, if we just look at DNA damage here by looking at gamma H2X, which is a marker for double-stranded breaks, when we do this in, in the normal cells, even if they're stretched 40%, which is a really substantial deformation, we actually do not see DNA damage in these cells. However, if we prevent this nuclear softening, by overexpressing the SUV, we start de seeing DNA damage. So what we think is that the, the cells need to reduce their nuclear stiffness and the membrane tension and to increase chromatin mobility to basically be able to dissipate the mechanical energy in this deformation that then prevents torsional stress of the DNA and thereby DNA damage. The mechanism of this, I'm not going into so much detail, but what we looked, was, looked at was a large number of mechanosensitive pathways, and, and the most consistently changed was intracellular calcium. So we imaged the nuclear deformation live when the cells were stretched, and, and we saw that also the nucleus was deformed, and this went hand in hand with the flashes of intracellular calcium. So we got elevation of intracellular calcium, also measured here in this heat map. So when we start stretching the cells, we see the surge of calcium in, in all of the cells. And if we pre-empty the ER calcium stores using Topsy Gargin, then if we start stretching the cells, we don't see this anymore. So we think that the ER, which is continuous with the nuclear envelope, is actually the source for this calcium. And, and finally, we, we started thinking what could be the calcium channel. And of course, we were particularly interested in this mechanosensitive stretch-induced calcium channels, of which one is piezo one So we asked whether piezo one could be involved, and we knocked the, this calcium channel down. And indeed, if we do this, now we basically, we fail to suppress the K9 in these stretch cells. And what will also happen that now, again, these cells start gaining DNA damage. So, so again, underlining that this calcium release and, and the subsequent modulation of the K9 heterochromatin is critical for this DNA damage protection. What was also interesting is that these cells were now unable to form this perinuclear actin ring, you might remember I mentioned in the beginning, and then the consequence of this was that now these nuclei started to gain this very abnormal shape. So we think that the actin ring is also downstream of the calcium release, and it's there to basically constrict the nucleus and thereby prevent nuclear volume increases when the nucleus is being deformed. However, when we knock down piezo, the alignment still perfectly occurs. So the question was, what is this alignment good for, and why do we have this restoration of the heterochromatin in this long-term stretching? So we started thinking that maybe the alignment somehow is an alternative form of mechanoprotection that allows the cells to reset the steady state chromatin architecture. So to test this hypothesis, Michele actually came up with a pretty simple and, and genius experiment. So what he did was he took the cells and stretched them for 40, with 40% 40 for 360 minutes so that he got this complete alignment. And then he just flipped the elastomer. And now instead of being perpendicularly oriented in the direction of stretch, the cells were oriented parallel. So they were kind of in the worst possible position, not being able to really avoid 
this deformation, and this was also illustrated by quantifying the nuclear deformation. So if you look at these cells that are oriented parallel, now they again have substantial deformation, whereas these cells that had fully aligned, the nucleus is almost not deformed at all, so really confirming that this orient perpendicular orientation prevents the real-time nuclear deformation when the cell is being stretched. And interestingly, what happened in these cells that the monolayer kind of partially even fell apart, so the cell, cell junctions were disassembled, really indicating that the cells are exposed to a lot of stress. We also saw the reappearance of the perinuclear acting rings, and we also saw kind of the re-embarkment of the nuclear mechanoprotection, so the reduction of the K9 trimethylation, really showing that this supracellular alignment is there to allow resetting of the chromatin architecture because the, the, it prevents the real-time nuclear deformation. So basically, to put everything together, we think that this type of nuclear mechanoresponses responses occur on multiple timescales. So we have these very fast responses, for example, this K9 trimethyl decrease that alters the chromatin rheology, and that's kind of an emergency break mechanoprotective mechanism that allow the cells to cope with, with these kind of large forces that appear suddenly in the tissue. However, if these uh, stresses continue, then you have more sustainable mechanisms such as this transcriptional repression, which allows the cells to change their transcriptomes to possibly better adapt to, to the mechanical stresses or prevent differentiation in, in conditions where you have high mechanical stress. And finally, you have this kind of more profound supracellular mechanisms which allow the tissue to change its architecture, whether it's now the simple reorientation of the monolayer perpendicular to the stretch, or then patterning of the tissue where cells are being delaminated and, and, and moving around to basically reform the tissue structure to be more compatible with, with mechanical stresses that, that are present in the tissue. And these all are reversible processes. So the supracellular re reorganization allows then the cell to reset the original chromatin architecture, reactivate transcription and, and so on. So basically the, the supracellular organization is, is a, the most sustainable form of adaptation in, into changing force environments. So with this, I, I, I want to close. I think I already acknowledged everybody who, was, who, who were the driving forces of the studies. And of course, I want to thank the entire lab for being such fantastic people that I have the pleasure to work with every day. Our, our collaborators, without whom this would not have been possible, our, our funding agencies, and of course, you for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you, Sarah, so much. It was a very interesting talk. And now we have a few questions to you. So Arunab uh, asks whether mechanical stress also happen in cancerous cells that undergo epithelial mesenchymal transition. We have seen that certain HeLa cells that became platin resistant and rapidly started dividing had an increased concentration of collagen on the surface. Yeah, so basically, I think most cells are exposed to some degree of, of mechanical stress because this can be very subtle if you have just local cell divisions or movements, even these can cause mechanical deformation. And of course, some tissues are more mechanically loaded than others, but definitely cancers, often you have remodeling of the stroma, you have collagen, increased collagen uh, deposition, collagen cross-linking, so cancers typically, for example, are stiffer. And, and that thereby there's a lot of mechano signaling going on there. And it has already been shown that actually it's part of, of the actual cancer aggression pathway that they respond to these cues and, and for example, become more migratory. And we are very interested also in trying to understand which of these mechanisms that I presented are cell type specific and which are more generic and are present in, in all cells. And for example, in, in this paper describing the genomic mechanotroprotection protection pathway, we could show actually that cancer cells, at least certain cancer cells that we tested, they are kind of insensitive to this signal because they already have very soft nuclei. So they kind of don't respond. But if we restore their nuclear stiffness, for example, by overexpressing lamin A, we can return the nuclear mechanosensitivity. So it seems that the mechanisms are universal, but kind of the steady state cell of the cell determines their kind of inherent mechanosensitivity, if you will. 
Thank you. Uh, another question from Abdu. Uh, in the crowding experiments, would artificial crowders such as beads or so provoke differentiation? Yeah, so uh, we of course have tested a few conditions. So we have this uh, artificial kind of uh, release of, of the tension and then we have the micro patterns. And then the third thing that we have tried is to basically compress the cells using PDMS stamps. And, and it, it seems to us like roughly speaking that whatever deforms the cells to some extent uh, sparks, sparks a similar response. So in this way, I would say yes, but uh, of course, I think the nature, kind of the amount of deformation and, and how long the deformation takes, they are, they are key. And sometimes it's kind of difficult to synchronize them between the different mechanical manipulations. Thank you. Uh, another question from Michaela. Uh, what do you think is the role of nuclear actin in tipping the balance of differentiation? Is it enhancing transcription by promoting formation of polymerase two clusters and thereby transcription? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question, and we have been trying very hard to figure that out, and we don't know yet. So unfortunately, we have tried very hard to do a nuclear actin chip to see where it would interact with with the genome and and other transcription factors and we have so far not been successful. Our favorite hypothesis is that it's kind of just unspecifically regulating the accessibility of chromatin and, and the reason why I say this is because um, there's some really interesting work showing how the, the nuclear actin is actually participating in expanding the chromosomes when the cells exit mitosis. So this would suggest that the, the actin can uh, kind of generate force that could open up the chromatin but we are still really struggling to to understand what what is the precise role of nuclear actin. Some people have reported kind of direct binding to the RNA polymerase too and very structural studies obviously also show that you can have G-actin as a structural component as in uh, different chromatin remodelers. So these are of course also very good candidate pathways to to look at. Uh, I also have a question, if I may ask. Uh, so if you do differentiation by cytokines with stem cells, because you probably work with patient-derived stem cells as well, do you see differences in differentiation? And have you maybe studied whether mechanical stress uh, stands behind this? So we, we have just started actually work with, with IPS cells exactly to try to understand what is the specific role of, of, of mechanical stress, so we, we don't know yet, but actually there is another group who was in, inspired by our work on, on, the, on the heterochromatin and what they can show that if you basically try to make iPS cells from differentiated cells and you expose them to mechanical stretch, then you lower the barrier towards uh, pluripotence. So, so it seems that indeed if, if the stretch kind of functions to reduce heterochromatinization in the form of this K9, this might alter the, the barriers of differentiation, again, kind of unspecifically, and then the different cytokines, growth factors, and transcription factors, they are the ones that generate the specificity. And that's how I like to also think about it, that the mechanical tension kind of sets the threshold, and then the specificity comes from the individual cytokines and, and, and transcription factors. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, do you observe that some cells keep the stem cell fate when adjacent cells go into differentiation? If one considers that this may ensure that stem cells are preserved, uh, for example, via cell-to-cell -cell communication, or do all stretch cells react similarly? Yeah, that's again a great question that we are trying to understand better. So whether there would still be kind of more prime states that could determine that, okay, cells could still have different sensitivities similar to what we observed in the cancer cells, so whether it could be that stem cells could be still more resistant and they would have different different properties that would make them more or respond differently to stress. So we unfortunately don't know that. And the reason why is that we lack kind of good reporters that we would in real time be able to report on the kind of the specific differentiation state of the stem cells and to understand that whether you would have some sort of intermediate differentiation states, for example. Okay, and we are just on time. I would like to thank, first of all, Sarah, for your amazing talk and also answering the Q&A section. And I also would like to uh, thank our attendees for asking interesting questions.
And I would like to invite everyone to our next talk with uh, Spencer Wells, which is happening in 10 minutes, I believe. Thank you a lot and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks for the great questions. Thank you.